In 1907, the Henkel Chemical Company in Dusseldorf launched the world's first self-activating detergent containing sodium perbolate and sodium silicate. Persil, Persil became an instant bestseller. And when the Allies allowed the Henkel plant to reopen after World War II, the reappearance of Persil in the shops was a symbol for many Germans in post-war Germany of some sort of return to normality. I will return to Persil shortly. In the 1920s, 16-year-old Anna Lottes went to work as a nanny for a Frankfurt Jewish family with two daughters. And even when the family could no longer afford to pay Anna during the period of hyperinflation in the late 20s in Germany, um, she insisted on staying for no pay. The 1935 Nuremberg laws made it illegal for Anna to work for a Jewish family. Forced to leave the family and to work for a non-Jewish family, Anna promptly had a nervous breakdown. A Jewish family helped her to find work in the Jewish hospital in Frankfurt, which was one of the few places where non-Jewish girls could still work. During the Holocaust, going forward a few years, when the patients were carted off from the hospital to the camps, Anna tried to go with them, but they wouldn't, uh, the, the authorities wouldn't allow her. So in the meantime, in 1938, the Jewish family that had been Anna's employers moved, escaped to London. And for the 12 months between the time they arrived in London and the start of World War II, there was a lively correspondence between Frankfurt and London as the family in London explained to uh, Anna how they were getting on and what was going on. Throughout the war, the family in London were desperately worried about what had happened to Anna. Had she survived? Had her family survived? And it wasn't until late 1946 that contact was re-established. And they discovered that Anna was indeed alive. The experiences of Anna and her family show that not all Germans were swept away by the Nazi madness. All the men in Anna's family, two brothers and two brothers-in-law, were sent to concentration camps for being socialists and Catholics, and not all of them survived. Anna was an implacable enemy of Hitler and all he stood for. Her post-war letters are noteworthy for their sense of moral outrage. Isn't it terrible because of one man because of his whim, I don't want to upset myself by ever mentioning his name. Anna accepted the privations of post-war life in Frankfurt philosophically. She said, the innocent have to suffer together with the guilty. But what really incensed Anna was that Nazis were re-emerging into public life. And on the 2nd of February, she wrote, we see the biggest Nazis running around in the street. The Nuremberg trials did not catch all the Nazis by any means. I know about Anna because she was my mother's nanny. And as a child, I learned about the Nazis at the same time as I learned that Anna wasn't one. And the 40-year correspondence between Anna and my mother forms the core of The Vow, my book on how my parents escaped from Nazi Germany as teenagers before World War II. And I know that some of you 
in the room today have read the vow. I think that there are still copies uh, downstairs on sale. Anna's words about Nazis still running around popped into my head when I read recently in the London Times that German Chancellor Angela Merkel has agreed to release documents to a commission of inquiry into Nazis who were employed in the German Chancellery, which is the equivalent of Downing Street, after World War II. The Chancellery had previously stonewalled on providing access to historians on this commission, and now, 71 years after the Nazis were defeated, the Chancellery has relented and acknowledged that Nazis had in fact been employed in public service in post-war Germany. So this afternoon, I want to explore the denazification process and to ask whether or not it met its objectives. Already during World War II, long before the end of the war, Allied leaders were planning to detoxify German society once the Nazi regime, the Nazi regime was defeated while being careful not to allow German society to collapse as it, had, as it had done after World War I. So the Allies' denazification policy was aimed at eliminating Germany's disgraced political elite and any remnants of Nazi ideology in German politics, society and culture, as well as the press, the economy and the judiciary. At Potsdam, Truman, Stalin, and Churchill agreed that, and I quote, all members of the Nazi party who have been more than nominal participants in its activities and all other persons hostile to allied purposes should be removed from public and semi-public office and from positions of responsibility in important private undertakings. Such persons shall be replaced by persons who, by their political and moral qualities, are deemed capable of assisting in developing genuine democratic institutions in Germany. German education shall be so controlled as to completely eliminate Nazi and militarist doctrines <coughs> and to make possible the successful development of democratic ideals. General Eisenhower, who had been the um, commander-in-chief of the, all the Allied um, forces that had defeated Germany, had few illusions about the time frame required for denazification. 50 years is what Eisenhower reckoned it would take. And at first, denazification was pursued zealously. Anyone wanting to get a job in the public service had to fill out a questionnaire about their activities and membership memberships during the Third Reich. In April 1945, and I think there may have been a TV, either documentary or even movie about this, the US Army discovered an almost complete list of Nazi party members, making the task of cross-checking names much easier. The German official who'd been given the task of destroying these eight, nine million names had, for reasons known to himself, decided not to and he handed these over, he told the Americans where to find them. But a number of factors soon intervened that drastically reduced Eisenhower's 50-year prediction. First, the very structure of the Nazi regime meant that in 1945 there were over 8 million Nazi party members, which is more than 10% of the population. And among teachers, lawyers, and civil servants, the percentage was much higher. So the sheer numbers explain the impracticality of going after everyone. Second, a major consideration that moderated the denazification effort was the concern that if the Allies offended the Germans too much, they would turn to communism. The Cold War, culminating in the Berlin air, um, airlift, shifted priorities drastically and suddenly German survival became a bigger priority than denazification. Third, 
Despite Washington's rhetoric about no safe havens for Nazis, <coughs> the denazification process was subverted by America's eagerness to exploit Hitler's rocket scientists for its own weapons programs. The German rocket scientists were light years ahead of the Americans, so 1,500 German scientists and engineers headed by Hitler's top rocket scientist Werner von Braun were spirited off to the United States to form the backbone of the country's missile and space programs. Fourth, the Allies lacked sufficient numbers of competent German speakers. Many American and British denazifiers were German and Austrian Jews, former refugees returning to administer justice against the murderers of their relatives. Not only German officials, but also senior figures among the Allied authorities questioned the, the objectivity of these Jewish interrogators. Could they, God forbid, be contaminated by a desire for revenge? And the fifth reason is that it soon became evident that an overzealous application of denazification would prevent talented people from participating in the reconstruction of Germany. Basic services couldn't be run without some former Nazis being allowed to work in the public service. For an excellent first-hand account of this chaotic period, written by an Austrian Jewish denazifier working for the British, do read this book, by George Clare, or Georg Klar, as his uh, birth name was, called Berlin Days. Some of you may have heard of his first book called Last Waltz in Vienna. This is the follow-up, and it is a brilliant uh, read. This is the same George Clare, who managed to get to Ireland despite the best efforts of the Irish consul in Berlin, the notoriously anti-Semitic um, Charles Bewley, who seems to turn up with amazing regularity in my talks. The culminative effect of the five factors I itemized was that the Allies started turning over responsibility for denazification to the Germans themselves. In other words, West Germany was left to cleanse itself, which brings me back to Persil. <laughs> During the denazification process, Persil came to be colloquially applied to anyone said to be cleansed of accusations of Nazi sympathizers. Persil became synonymous with the corrupt system of a black market in good character certificates known as the Persilschein. Everyone in Germany after the war knew the difference between Persil, the detergent, and the Persilschein, by which many Nazis managed to get back into the uh, uh, public service as a result <coughs> of monkey business. Each of the four Allied zones had a German minister of denazification, and under the 545 civilian German administered tribunals, the denazification process underwent a subtle but significant change. Henceforth, the aim was rehabilitation rather than merely punishment. Faced with a gigantic caseload, the German tribunals looked for ways of speeding up the process. So one example, members of the Nazi party born after 1919 were not regarded as having been Nazis on the grounds that they had been brainwashed. In Bavaria, 75% of officials dismissed by the Americans were reinstated by the Germans, and 60% of senior Nazis were reclassified. Amnesty laws were passed affecting almost 800,000 people, including a pardon for people with six-month sentences, 35,000 people with sentences up to one year, and over 3,000 functionaries of the SA, the SS, and the Nazi party who had participated in dragging victims 
to jails and camps. Also pardoned were 20,000 other Nazis sentenced for, and I quote, deeds against life. We call this murder. And 30,000 sentenced for causing bodily injury. So within seven years after the fall of the Nazi regime, the West German government basically closed down the denazification program. The West German political system emerging from the occupation claimed that it was starting with a clean sheet. The main culprits claimed Konrad Adenauer had been prosecuted. Government policy now focused on reparations and compensation for the victims of Nazi rule. The Germans chose to avoid confronting the truth by taking what one historian has called the sleep cure. One inevitable result is that many former Nazis ended up again in the political apparatus of Western Germany. One example is a certain Hermann Arendt, who joined the Nazi party in 1931. In 1945, the British considered him so dangerous, a security risk, that they interned him for two years. He re-entered politics, and by 1954, he was the Lower Saxony Minister of Economics. Addressing the political rally, he argued that formerly prominent Nazis should not have to stay in the background for a decent interval before elbowing their way to the center of the political stage. And I quote, we have recognized that politics may not be left in the hands of racially alien elements. We left the political stage in 1945, but we returned to it because there was no other choice. Close inverted commas. No prizes for guessing to which racially alien elements Arendt was referring. The West's abandonment of stringent denazification was a gift to Soviet and East German propaganda, which claimed that West Germany was an extension of the old Nazi regime. This was a bit rich when you consider that the East Germans absorbed large numbers of former Gestapo members into their own police force, the Volkspolizei. Nevertheless, the constant barrage of criticism from East Germany did have an effect. Some of you may remember a couple of months ago, I described the Black Book of Russian Jewry, in which the Russians documented the Nazi crimes against the Jews on Soviet territory. In 1965, the East Germans published the Brown Book. The names of thousands of war criminals and Nazis in the Federal Republic, in government, business, administration, army, judiciary, <coughs> and science. By the third edition in 1968, the list included 15 ministers and state secretaries, 100 generals and admirals of the Bundeswehr, 828 judges, state prosecutors, and top, top judicial officers, 245 leading officials of the Foreign Office, 297 senior police officers and employees of the intelligence service. The Brown Book shattered the myth of the clean break with Germany's Nazi past. Ministers resigned. West German Chancellor Kurt Georg Kissinger, not our Kissinger, who was unmasked in the Brown Book as a confidant of both Ribbentrop and Goebbels, and who had been in charge of foreign propaganda in the occupied territories until 1945, denounced the book as a work of communist propaganda. Well, he would, wouldn't he? He had the second edition impounded as part of a spectacular police operation at the Frankfurt Book Fair. But even the impact of the Brown Book soon diminished. The Cold War, the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the unification of Germany and the demands of Realpolitik all helped the process of amnesia. Many historians propagated the myth that the Nazi regime's foreign office was the only ministry that had shunned the persecution of Jews. This myth was shattered in 2003 when an obituary 
of a former West German chief diplomat in Barcelona appeared in a German Foreign Office internal newsletter. The obituary omitted to mention that he was a war criminal. And the public furore that followed prompted then Foreign Minister Joschka Fischer to convene an international committee of Israeli, German, and American historians to delve <coughs> into the history of the foreign ministry during and after the war. And the committee's 2010 report showed that the foreign ministry was not somehow caught up in national socialism and was not the haven of resistance that had long been claimed. From the very start, German foreign ministry diplomats played an active role in deciding where the Jews should be deported and sent to the gas chambers. One of the most highly publicized findings of the study was an expenses slip submitted by one Franz Rademacher, a member of Ribbentrop's foreign ministry. This is the same Rademacher who attended the Wannsee conference in January 1942 where Hitler's final solution was rubber stamped. But before this, in October 1941, Rademacher had traveled, traveled to Serbia. <laughs> the best tradition of conscientious civil servants, he filled in a travel expenses form. And in the section that asked for the reason for his trip, Rademacher wrote, liquidation of the Jews in Belgrade. The 2010 report confirmed what the Brown Book had claimed, that hundreds of former Nazi diplomats were working for West Germany in 1965. German Foreign Minister Guido Westerwelle unambiguously accepted the findings of this 2010 report. He said he was shamed by the cold administrative detachment with which the foreign ministry had contributed to the systematic genocide of the Jews of Europe. And I quote, how terrible that the killing of Jews became a civil servant's regular activity in the foreign ministry. He also expressed shame that even after the war, some foreign office officials continued their harassment of Jews. And he pointed to the example of West, German, West Germany's Consul General in Jerusalem, Walter Derler, who made life miserable for German Jews who had fled to Palestine by stalling on their pension applications. Joschka Fischer, who had initiated this report, said that it made him sick to think of the findings. Which brings us back to the article in The Times. The Foreign Office Inquiry prompted Ernst Urlau, the head of Germany's Foreign Intelligence Agency, the BND, to push for a commission inquiry into the shadowy early years when the BND had hired former Nazi criminals. Now, the BND is answerable to the German Chancellery. And although the researching historians were promised full and unlimited access to all BND documents, as we saw earlier, the Chancellery originally denied this access. Now, as of two months ago, they have access, and it's expected that the full report of the findings will be published in 2017. And we already know that the report will focus on the activities of Reinhard Gehrler, a former Wehrmacht general who headed intelligence gathering on the Eastern Front. He was recruited by the US military after the war, and he ran an anti-USSR spy ring known as the Galen Organization, or the Org, consisting of hand-picked former German intelligence agents. And the Org eventually grew to 4,000 undercover agents who were absorbed into the BND Foreign Intelligence Agency when it was created in 1956. And at the time, the British press openly mocked the Gestapo boys working in the BND's Munich headquarters. Which brings me to the multifaceted story 
of one Otto Scorenzi, a story that combines denazification, Persil, the Org, German rocket scientists, the Republic of Ireland, and the Mossad. <laughs> Scorenzi was Hitler's favorite commander, having rescued Mussolini from an Italian hilltop fortress. Some of you might know this episode. Scorenzi also commanded English-speaking German soldiers dressed in American uniforms, operating behind Allied lines, and he was regarded by Allied intelligence services as the most dangerous man in Europe. Scorenzi was denazified in 1952 by a West German government arbitration board, probably thanks to a Persilschein. After General Naguib's 1952 coup that toppled King Farouk's regime in Egypt, Reinhard Gehlen's org spying sent Scorenzi to Egypt to act as Naguib's military advisor quite why West Germany, that was already negotiating with Israel over Holocaust reparations, was also helping Egypt to defeat the Jewish state, is for another day. Scorenzi recruited former SS and Wehrmacht officers to train the Egyptian army. Scorenzi also trained Arab volunteers, including one Yasser Arafat, to make terror raids into Israel via the Gaza Strip in 1953 and 1954. In 1957, using a special passport for stateless persons, Scorenzi was guest of honor at a glittering reception in the Port Marnock Count, uh, Country Club Hotel, County Dublin. According to the evening press, the ballroom was packed with representatives of various societies, professional men, and several TDs, including Charlie Hoey. In 1959, Scorenzi bought Martin's Town House, a 160-acre farm and mansion in the Curra, and he could be seen driving around in his white Mercedes. RTE presenter, Cathal O'Shannon, estimated that between 100 and 200 Nazis moved to Ireland mm -hmm. after the war. And as journalist Kim Bielenberg wrote at the time, Nazis must have felt reasonably welcome in Ireland and were probably left alone or even fated as Scorenzi was. However, Scorenzi was never granted a residency visa by the Irish government, mainly because of the intervention of Noel Brown who told the door that Scorenzi was engaging in anti-Semitic activities. I quote, it is generally understood that Scorenzi plays some part in neo-Nazi activities, and if so, he should not be allowed to use Ireland for that purpose. But Scorenzi's inability to settle in Ireland is not the end of the Scorenzi story. Werner von Braun, Hitler's missile genius now running the American missile program, tried to persuade other German scientists, that's the ones who hadn't gone over with him in 1945, <clears throat> who had worked under him on the V2 program to join the US program. One of these scientists was called Heinz Krug, and he opted instead to help develop Egypt's secret strategic missile program, which was, of course, devoted to destroying the Jewish state. Feeling vulnerable following Israel's 1961 capture and trial of Adolf Eichmann, Krug asked Nazi hero Skorenzi to protect him. Enter the Mossad, Israel's secret service, which wanted to get rid of Krug. Now the Mossad was very aware of Scorenzi's anti-Israel activities in Egypt, but instead of targeting Scorenzi, the Mossad decided to recruit him. Unaware that Scorenzi had already been turned by the Mossad, Krug left his office in Munich 
to meet Scorenzi in September 1962 and was never seen again. Why did Scorenzi agree to work for the Mossad? Well, he told the Mossad that he was motivated by a desire to have his name erased from Nazi hunter Simon Wiesenthal's list of wanted Nazi war criminals. And the Mossad seems to have justified their recruitment of Scorenzi as a necessary means to an important strategic end. So when I read that the German Chancellery had agreed to open its files on the Nazi past of the BND, I remembered Anna's words, we see the biggest Nazis running around in the street. Today, we looked at how Eisenhower's 50-year time frame for the completion of the denazification program rapidly shrunk. We saw how the Allies' lofty denazification principles were compromised for the sake of a more urgent priority, the need to stabilize German society as a bulwark against communism. We saw how denazification was diluted by the need to exploit the expertise of Nazi scientists and engineers. And we saw the impact of the Persil effect. And we saw how the abandonment of the denazification program by the post-war German administration led to so many former Nazis being employed in the public service, especially government ministries. So, can we categorically state whether denazification was a job well done or a whitewash? Probably not. We must acknowledge that neo-Nazism never came close to upsetting the functioning, if complacent and sleepwalking, democracy established under Adenauer. The German people achieved stability not by denazification, not by exorcising Hitler, but by forgetting him. On the other hand, more than 70 years after the denazification pro pro process began, it is still casting its long shadow over contemporary German society. So maybe Eisenhower's prediction wasn't all that wrong after all. I want to make a very, very brief excursion to the Chilcot report. I do not want to go into the findings, apart from stating a very solitary position, that in my personal opinion, if we follow the logic of the anti-Blair witch hunt, no democratic state will ever again be able to wage war. But that's not what I want to talk about today. I think it's clear that events in Iraq might have been different if the US and the UK had taken a leaf out of the denazification process and implemented a de bathification or a de Saddam Husseinification process in Iraq. That's what occurred to me last week when the Chilcot report came out. Two weeks ago, we learned of the sad death of that most eloquent survivor of the Nazi inferno, Elie Wiesel. In 1984, then West German Chancellor Helmut Kohl wanted to put Germany's Nazi past to rest and to normalize the German people by distinguishing between the evil Nazi SS and the good German soldiers. Kohl invited President Ronald Reagan to lay a wreath at the Bitburg military cemetery where many members of the Waffen SS, the military arm of the SS, was bur were buried. This is the same Waffen SS that was judged to be a criminal organization <coughs> by the Nuremberg trial. The Bitburg controversy was compounded by the fact that Reagan's original schedule did not include a visit to any former Nazi concentration camp. Just before Reagan left for Germany 
to visit the Bitbo Cemetery, Elie Wiesel attended an awards ceremony after he received the Congressional Medal of Honor, the highest civilian honor that Congress can bestow. And in a private meeting before the ceremony, Reagan explained to Wiesel that it was too late to cancel the war graves visit. Minutes later, in the Roosevelt Room ceremony, Wiesel turned publicly to Reagan and he said, I belong to a people that speaks truth to power. I implore you to do something else, to find another way, another site. Mr. President, your place is not that place. Your place is with the victims of the SS. Wiesel lost the battle. Reagan visited Bitburg, but I think we can say that Wiesel probably won the war. Because within a decade in Germany, a new generation emerged that was more sensitive to the Holocaust, and public exhibitions were held on the Wehrmacht's participation <coughs> in the killing process. I want to close with a point <coughs> of Elie Wiesel anecdote concerning Rabbi Yisrael Lau, the former chief rabbi of Israel. Lau was the youngest child survivor of Buchenwald. After the liberation, he was sent to a French resettlement center for Jewish children, and it was there that he learned of his mother's murder at the hands of the Nazis. Unable to recite the Kaddish, the Jewish memorial prayer, <coughs> Lau was helped by a young man in the resettlement center. Almost four decades later, at a 1983 commemoration of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, Rabbi Lau learned for the first time the identity of the Buchenwald survivor who taught him the words of the Kaddish in France. Yes, it was Elie Wiesel. May his memory be blessed. Thank you very much. Thank you.